listening to Ding Dong Darkness Time Season 2, Stephen King Boogaloo. I gathered several of my most well-read friends together to discuss many of our favorite works by the master of the macabre himself. If you like what you hear, tell the world. In the meantime, let's talk some scary stories. Oh, and beware the spoilers, folks. They're a doozy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Ding Dong Darkness Time as we continue our journey through some of Stephen King's most iconic works. And today I am bolding and underlining the word darkness because we are here to talk about what I believe is Stephen King's most terrifying novel, a cautionary tale of death, grief, and the madness we risk by avoiding those things, Pet Cemetery. Um, And I'm extremely excited to be joined by my friend and crime author, James D.F. Hanna. He is the Seamus Award-winning author of the Henry Malone series. His most recent novel, Behind the Wall of Sleep, won the 2020 Seamus Award for Best Paperback Original. Congratulations on that, by the way. That's awesome. And he has oodles of short work appearing in Shotgun Honey, the anthology of Appalachian writers, and so much more. And when I put out the call in my social circles for folks interested in coming onto the show to discuss their favorite Stephen King books, James chimed right in on Pet Cemetery, and I knew we had to combine forces. So first of all, thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me on. Alfred. You know, I am a big fan of your work and always love a good chance to talk about books. I love Pet Cemetery. We have very similar opinions on this as we were talking um, before the show. And I know from our previous conversation on this that this is your first Stephen King book that you had read. And so that was hugely intriguing to me because I can't imagine how high that had to set the bar for you in terms of pure horror. Um, But how old were you at the time and what did it do to you reading this thing (laughs) just out of the blue? That cemetery may have been like the first strict horror novel that I had ever read uh, because I was very much like a child of uh, PI fiction. And I was like to everyone. I read Hardy Boys and The Three Investigators and all that stuff. But I read Pet Cemetery. I was older. I mean, I just quote unquote older when I read it. I was like a freshman in high school. So like 14. Yeah. I, it completely sucked me in. I was a voracious reader uh, around that age anyway. And I was reading it on the bus going to school. I was reading it, you know, between classes. I had an algebra class, and I remember my desk was in the main back of the class, and I remember having the book down in my lap reading it. And so it was painfully obvious probably to anyone around me that I'm not paying a lick of attention to what teachers got to say. And I, teachers talking, teachers talking, and I all of a sudden, I was like, everything – it's really quiet, and I look up, and there's my teacher staring straight at me. And she's like, are you ready to join the rest of the class? I was like, yeah. I set the, pull the book up, put it back in my backpack, we're done. But it was. It was the first thing I ever read, uh, 14 or so, and it just fucked me up so much. I was not prepared for that at all. Well, and it was interesting because, like, I had this idea of what Stephen King was because, I mean, by four, I'm 14, so it's 1987 um, because I am old. And, you know, King was fairly, you know, ubiquitous in pop culture. You know, he was just all over the pop culture landscape. And I was that, that kid who was like, oh, I don't read horror. I don't watch scary stuff. I don't watch horror because it scares me. How dare that thing do what it's designed to do? Right. And so, but then, like, I don't know, there was something about, like, the, the iconography on that cover for Pet Cemetery is so great. Because that original cover is just, like, the type and, and, and Pet Cemetery in big letters. And then the cat. You know, it's a great, gorgeous illustrated cover with the cat and the cemetery in the background. And it's yes. just, like, it is begging you to read that. And And you had no idea, though, I mean, really what you were getting into because... I mean, at, at that age, in, in that year, that movie hadn't come out yet, even. So um, it was, for me, I was the same age as you, but I'm a few years younger than you. I was, um, it was around 1992, and I was probably 
I was like 12 or 13 um, at that time when I read it. And so we were a similar age, but the movie had been out. I hadn't seen it. I didn't know anything about it because my mom wouldn't let me watch it. Um, I remember my dad renting it and I was like, what is this movie? And why is Cemetery spelled this way? <laughs> That's the first thing <laughs> that occurred to me, the misspelling of it. I'm like, what is this? Was I spelling Cemetery wrong the whole time or what? So you're absolutely right. That cover just screams to you, pick me up, open me, read me. Um, it was like my third King book by that point, third or fourth. I was kind of starting to get my way in. I started with Misery, uh, that Carrie, and then, um, oh, probably The Shining, I think it was. And then I got into Pet Cemetery. So I was already aware, of course, that I was going to be frightened reading this book, but I... I was not prepared for the horror that was awaiting me. And honestly, neither was King himself in his own talk about this book. He hates this book. He says that it kind of had a nihilistic bent to it, that it was ended. It ended in such a dark way. And we'll get to the ending later. But he put it in a drawer after he wrote it and was like, whoa, I'm not touching this thing again. It's going away. But then he had to provide a final book to Doubleday before he uh, parted ways with them. And that was the only one that he had. And so he gave it to them and they, you know, became one of his biggest commercial successes, but he never promoted it even. He said that by the time Doubleday got it, he went on with his life. He didn't do any real run up to publication, talk about it or press or anything like that, even though Doubleday did a big ad campaign for it. But he didn't do any talk about it. And he almost just kind of wanted to not have anything to do with it anymore. The book kind of haunts him to this day, um, which I find absolutely fascinating and kind of relatable. Um, have you ever written anything yourself that has gone to a place that frightens you and you kind of feel like, oh, God, I don't I don't that this is me, but it's not me. And I don't know where that came from. And I don't know that I want to see it again. <laughs> it, 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 it's funny, though. Like, my, my novels are all P.I. novels. Um, but when I, you know, the short, but the short stories uh, tend to be more noir influence. And so they're all, like, uh, they all tend to be, like, very dark little nuggets and stuff. And I just finished up the short story that's out on submission right now for an anthology that goes into the relationship between the main character and his father. And there's actually, and I ended up cutting this because it, it just made the story too long. But the father had this really insanely dark anecdote that he tells his son. And I remember writing it and I, just as I was working on it and thinking to myself, you are definitely working out some shit right now, dude. It bothered me so much. I, I'm, I'm actually I'm glad I took it out of the story, and it may live in something else someday. But it was definitely that sense of like this is this is probably as messed up as I have gotten, uh, as as dark as I have gotten. And, I, and but I think sometimes necessary is required in the story. Yeah, you're you're right. And sometimes you do feel like there's something in you in. I think so much of the subconscious plays in what we do, right? And so we expel something from there. A bubble arises and, you know, it, we don't know where it comes oh, from yeah. or why necessarily. And we look at it and we're like, what what just happened here? Um, and, and then... It's cheaper than therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is that, you know, King himself has a, a bit of an aversion to psychiatry um, himself. And it, it's played out in a lot of his stories um, over time. I was learning that when I was doing my research on Night Shift, that there were a few stories in that book that play to his own uh, fears of being analyzed. And so it seems like he uses his books as and his stories as an opportunity to do that, um, which I can relate to, to a certain extent. Um, my book strings is absolutely not representative of who I am on a, on a, on a belief level, on a conscious level, but that book is extremely dark, extremely violent and very visceral. And I can't go back there again. I was in a very unique place at the time that I wrote it. 
And in many ways, I, I admire my work on that book, but I can't go back there. And so when I've toyed around with doing a sequel to it, I realize I'm not writing the the horror thriller that that book is. I'm writing more of my typical suspense, psychological suspense stuff because right. I can't get back to that moment in time, that dark pocket that I was living in when I wrote that, when I was on painkillers because I had thrown out my back and I was messed up from that and I was feeling very very cynical and nihilistic and so it just like poured out of me and so I feel like King given what we know he was dealing with when he wrote this he was dealing he was in the throes of his own addictions he was you know probably dealing with a lot of other darkness and anxiety and of course he was a new father at the time that he came up with the idea for this book, he he explained in 1979, he was a writer in residence at the University of Maine, and they lived in a country house on a on a very busy, dangerous road uh, that had a lot of trucks passing by it. So that is very much taken from life, the book is in that sense, and that their cat was hit and killed on that road by a truck. And so his experience with having to explain death to his daughter through the death of the cat. And then also he started toying around with the idea of like, they had a, a brand new baby boy. What if he got hit by a, a truck in the road? And then it, he kind of went from there on it. And out of that probably came every fear that I think a parent tends to feel at the loss of a child and, and, and exploring those very, very dark corners and it's he also uses inspiration the short story the monkey's paw from 1902 if you go on google if you search for the monkey's paw by ww w. jacobs you can read it i'm pretty sure it's public domain terrifying short story um by the way i highly recommend it king even quotes the the story in uh pet cemetery a couple times um but I think it's it's interesting that he has an aversion to that book as well. He didn't even have Tabitha, his wife, who reads all of his work. He didn't even have her read it. He wrote it and he literally stuck it in a drawer and said, yep, I got that out of me. I'm good. But it did go on to become one of King's biggest commercial successes. I think because it has a universal appeal in the sense of whether or not you're a parent, I don't think you have to be a parent. It's, obviously, we were teenagers when we read this. We didn't have kids yet. Um, terrified us in in its own way, as it as maybe we it made us think about our own mortality as young people. Maybe that's the lens we're looking at it through. But if you do read it again after you've grown up a little bit and had some life experiences, whether or not that's becoming a parent or finding a, um, you know, a partner, or you've lost some people that mean something to you. And I think in the last couple of years, especially, we've seen a lot of death in this world. Um, I feel like it even has, has an even more powerful touchstone that way. I feel like grief is such a thick smog right now, even if we're not directly acknowledging that. So, um, so I do believe on that basis alone, the story remains very, very powerful and relevant. But let's talk about the story, shall we? Let's get into the meat of this thing. Because it begins on a very idyllic note, does it not? We have uh, uh, the Creeds, an American, standard American family, mom, dad, two kids, and a cat. They're traveling from Chicago to Maine uh, in a station wagon, moving to the New England countryside where Lewis, a doctor, uh, has accepted a position as the director of the campus infirmary at the University of Maine. And almost off the bat, when they arrive, the kids get hurt. <laughs> Which, and yeah. the, I mean, it does, he doesn't waste any time here. We have the little girl, Ellie. She's about five, I believe. She's playing on a swing in the backyard, falls off it, scrapes her knee. Gage, the baby, he's about nine months old at this time in the story, he gets stung by a bee and there's chaos. It's just immediately, but we don't see that immediately as foreshadowing, do we? Cause it's like, they're stressed out. They're kids. Shit happens when you're moving and you're having a bad day. You're just kind of like chalking it up to that, but it's only in retrospect that you see 
that this place has a thing going on. Um, it's setting its hooks in. That's when, of course, the Creeds make acquaintance with the neighbors across the road, uh, Judd and Norma Crandall, or especially Judd. Uh, he's an old guy. He's in his 80s. But Lewis and Judd form a very strong bond. And the two set about a nightly ritual of sharing some beers on the porch while the old man just talks about the history of the town and, you know, they just become really good friends. So, you know, it seems like it's going pretty well so far, but then Ellie uh, notices up the perfectly mown path going from the back of their yard down into the woods beyond. And I always found this element really interesting because that path is just maintained. Why? Why is it there? I mean, immediately you're thinking to yourself, this this is ominous. I mean, if you just saw, if you moved into a house and you saw a path like this, would you not immediately be on that thing? Oh, yeah. I mean, within, I mean, there's no way. Because they're, they're coming from Chicago, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're coming from Chicago. And this is like their new discovery of this. You know of this town, and it actually i mean they they bring out the the path they discuss it early on, I feel like they did they don't explore it for a little while, no, they kind of have their friendship and and they get to know each other a little bit, and the families yeah. kind of intermingle, and then finally Judd is like, "Oh, it's a nice day. Pop the baby in a backpack carrier. Let's go on a little hike. I'll show you where that path goes and so they do. And uh, it's about a, a about a mile walk uh, through the woods. And when they get to a clearing, that's way, where they find the pet cemetery. And this place on its own is creepy as shit because it's almost like this druidic thing. And it's formed by the neighborhood kids that have all lost pets most of them on that road that have been hit by cars on that road over the years. Right. And the graves are all handmade and they're arranged in concentric circles in this clearing in a forest. Already you can hear the ominous uh, chorus, you know, singing in the background of like, what? Who does Chisler's this? voices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it is uh, in my mind's eye, I, I was immediately fascinated. I have never in my life seen something like this. I've been to a pet cemetery. I've lost uh, pets. And, you know, there is a local pet cemetery, but it looks more like a normal cemetery, like a human cemetery. It isn't this weird pagan rustic thing in the middle of a main forest. <laughs> <laughs> and I could imagine if I knew there was something like that within a mile of my house. Well, first of all, I would be, I would probably be there every day because I'm a weirdo that loves being around things that scare me. But at the same time, like I would probably be going, we got to move, you know, like, like normal people, not like me would probably be, we got to get out of here. <laughs> this, this is too weird. Who does this? What I like that, what that King does with it when he, when he's talking about the, the cemetery is like the little descriptors of each of the, the quote unquote yes. King stuff. <laughs> yes. And like, you know, talking about the names on them and everything, like General Patton. And there was one that was a parrot, but my favorite is Smucky. He was obedient. Yes. And, and but 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 then he but then there was one that was like Hannah. There was like Hannah. He talks about this. That someone had taken and etched out, and again, I think it was in stone. Mm -hmm. and it was like yo, know, Hannah, the best dog that ever lived. And he talked about what it must have taken for like a a, a for small hand to have etched in stone mm -hmm. this this grave marker like that. And the expression of grief among these kids who've lost their pets. I mean, I, I can't even imagine it. I, I know when I have lost pets, both as a kid and as an adult, I, I, I wouldn't say that I handled it in the most dignified manner. I don't know that I would have had the, um, the strength and wherewithal to probably carve something into stone. I think because it's just, uh, in a lot of ways, you just kind of want to curl up and cry and just kind of mope about your day until finally you feel 
like you can get, go on again. Um, so the thought of, of kids doing this and the ritual that he described later on is, you know, they talked a little more about this place, about how they had funerals that they would like carry the dogs uh, down there. Oh, and, oh, and what was the other one? Oh, yeah. Judd talked about how somebody buried his bull there, like actually yeah. pulled a, a, a dead steer, a dead bull up into that pet cemetery. Um, and he also buried him yep. in the other cemetery, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, <laughs> but uh, but already there's just I love how King always builds his suspense and his horror by giving you so many tiny little clues and things start to feel eerie but it's not scary yet so we're at the eerie portion of the build where it's like okay this is a little odd but it's not it's not harming me yet it's just giving me like a little tingle on the back of my neck but then they get back and here's where we see the real fracture take place because you know, Ellie being five years old, she is just coming to terms with the ways of the world and the way kids at that age do. And so in her little head, she thinks, I have a pet cat. Oh, my God. All those animals that were somebody's pets, what's going to happen to my pet? So she has a very natural discussion with Lewis about their cat and you know, the inevitability of his death. And of course, Ellie doesn't take it well at that age. I mean, that's upsetting to have that discussion. The kid cries and he comforts her as best he can. But then he goes into the other room where Rachel, who has had a very traumatic experience with death as a child and to this day doesn't handle death very well at all. She's highly avoidant of it entirely they have a massive fight and then you see the the sort of fracture between this couple that seems so solid but this is like a very dark and deep crevasse that's between them and they have a very fundamental difference in belief of of how to approach death or whether or not they should even approach it at all um which is interesting i think it mirrors a lot of cultural aspects in our own culture in this country about how we deal with death. And that is that we often do not. We have a largely death avoidant society. We don't like to talk about, for instance, what are you, we gonna, what are you going to do with my things when we die? Most Americans don't have wills. Um, they don't like to talk about their arrangement. And then our funerals, we involve, we try to make the, the dead person look as lively as possible. And, you know, right. which is all part of this death avoidance culture. So I feel like King was even exploring that. On a personal note, and, and, and I'll say this, um, my mother passed away last year. And it was uh, extremely difficult. I'm, I'm from East Kentucky, and we, we make a lot of to-do with, with funerals, mm -hmm. and you traditionally always have like the open casket funeral. I mean, and, and the idea is to make everyone look quote unquote as natural as possible. And let's be honest with you, there's just no way to do that. No. And and this is this is during COVID, and and my mother passed away from from COVID related complications, and so it you know there was extra time, and I never once. I, this was my own avoidance of that. I never once could look at her in the casket. Yeah. Because that was never going, that was not that last image that I would have wanted for my mother. You know, we, we do, we do everything possible to avoid that idea of death. And it's really interesting because King, making Lewis a doctor and how he deals with everything very matter of fact. And, and even going to, like, when, when Ellie starts asking him questions about, like, what is death? You know, what, you know, do you believe in heaven? You know, what do you think happens when, after someone dies? Um, you know, and, and, and Ellie's willingness to talk about that. Because kids will talk about that. Death is theoretical when you're five years old. But then Rachel, whose experiences with death are a lot more personal, mm -hmm. you know, her experiences with mortality are much more personal, uh, is much more... She, Lewis is, is very emotion, not emotionally detached, but academic, you know, I would say. He's very yeah. clinical. In it. Yeah, yeah, he's very clinical. He's very clinical in how he's looking at all of it. Rachel has a much more visceral response to everything. And it, it's really, I think, very much the, the two sides of how we 
as a, as a culture kind of, you know, try to look at death, you know, between, you know, an emotional attachment, but also emotional investment. I can completely relate to the aversion to wanting to see a loved one in in the casket. I have a I I had a very bad experience with that as a teenager, and I think that was wh- uh, part of the reason why this book both draws me in and terrifies me so much. I think it it was a funeral. It was a open casket. It was of a a beloved friend and coworker who died very suddenly of natural causes, and seeing this very lively energetic, hilarious person in that state. Um, it, I think I probably would have handled it better if I had seen him <laughs> to use a very, a, a very poorly worded phrase. If I had seen him freshly dead, um, as opposed to what he was rendered into as almost like a prop. I think that was the thing that I was not prepared for it was the makeup it was the the clothing you know that I never would have seen him in in life you know so and that lives in my memory now I was 16 when I went to that funeral and here I am at 42 I can still perfectly see him lying there and it's never left my head every detail of that my soul gets Rachel like on a very deep level and you want to protect your kids from having to see that you want to protect your kids from having to have those nightmares that you had even though there are healthier ways to go about this discussion that don't result in creating another Rachel you know what I mean so it's like our dysfunction tends to roll downhill and so I get that. Absolutely. And and you're right. It does feel like two sides of us warring, right? When you look at Lewis and Rachel that way, I just, I found that very starkly affecting and moving even the first time I read it because it mirrored a lot of my own internal conflict on death and it still does um, in many ways. Um, but then they have this horrible fight and you know, it doesn't end on a peaceful note. They have there. She gives him the cold shoulder for a couple of days. Lewis then ha- goes to his first day on the job at the infirmary at the university. And he arrives on campus immediately seeing chaos because a young man, a, a student, a jogger was hit by a car and he has a grave injury, a head injury, and they bring him in to the clinic and his head is just, you could see into his head. He's, it, you know, very, very it's bad. It's an incredibly graphically described injury. King spares no, uh, not, throughout this entire book, he spares no opportunity <laughs> to describe something awful. And Victor Pascal is the young man's name. And... As he's dying on the floor and the chaos of them trying to get ambulances there and everything, Lewis finds himself alone with this young man in his dying moments. And Victor addresses Lewis by name. The two are strangers. They never met before ever. And then at the moment, uh, Lewis, again, being the clinical doctor man that he is, um, writes that off as stress induced kind of hallucination. He's had a, he had just had this horrible fight with his wife about death comes in on his first day on the job to this young man dying on his floor from this grievous head wound. I think any of us, I think would try to insert logic into that situation and just go, yeah, I didn't hear what I thought I heard. Well, but that's always Lewis. Lewis is always looking for that logical explanation. Yeah. You know, he's always looking for the, you know, the thing that makes sense, but he's continually throwing himself into these circumstances where there's nothing that makes sense. Someone described this as like, Pet Cemetery is basically people continuing to make terrible decisions over and over again. Yes. And and that's very much like Lewis is, is always looking for something that makes sense in a world that suddenly, for no apparent reason, stops making sense. And you know what I find interesting about that is not only are people making horrible choices in this book, they know they are making horrible choices in this book. And that to me is a fascinating thing. And, and 
again, I and I circle back to this a lot, and I will this season as we're talking about King because I think th- this topic is, is inextricable from him. Is it's the thought process of someone with an addiction. It is someone who knows that every single time when they have uh, an addiction to drugs or alcohol, every time they crack open a beer, every time they snort some cocaine, whatever, every time they're about to do it, they know it's bad and they shouldn't do it, but they do it anyway, because they're trying to satisfy some other baser need uh, or craving or something that is a like a part of the lizard brain, you know, and it, and it doesn't follow that logic. And eventually Lewis's logic and obsession with rationalizing things leads to his downfall he that it it turns on him as he starts to rationalize his horrible decisions much later in the story and that's where that can kind of get you into trouble is when you are in that clinical mode of over analyzing things or over over rationalizing things you start to rationalize the irrational i was thinking about this because this was like what was this this is only the pet cemetery is 83 right Yes. I mean, and Carrie was 73 or 74. Yeah, because like Carrie 74, Salem Flot 75. Yeah. You know, so I mean, this is technically his, like, not about like 10th, 10th novel. He, he he was already putting out like short story collections and, and whatnot by this point. And he had done some nonfiction stuff. But I mean, he's 10 books in, you know, in nine years. I wasn't sure where this fell uh, into the uh, into the Stephen King, you know, funding the Colum- the Colombian uh, National Treasury uh, <laughs> timeline. Yeah, I mean, of, like just how much fucking coke he was doing, dude. He was uh, so sure coked out. <laughs> Well, which, and, and I have read the Tommy Knocker, so I know that he was doing a lot of coke. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Which is because coke is the only thing that explains the Tommy Knocker. But no, so much of his stuff around this time really is, you know, it is him acting out his subconscious and talking about uh, addiction. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it really is. So much of his stuff is, is, you know, in particular at this time, Christine is very much an addiction novel. Oh, oh, uh, for sure. In fact, he, when he put this book in the drawer, um, he wrote Christine, which he liked a lot better and was really focused and more passionate about that book. But you're right. They both deal yeah. with that theme in its own way. Read it. When I read this book the first, you know, when I read it the first time, you know, now 35 years ago, um, really just like being amazed that it just for the longest chunk in the book, it just felt like, is this book going to be about anything more than two guys sitting on the porch drinking beer? <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, and, and shooting the shit for like, you know, because it's not by Stephen King standards, a huge book. It's less than 400 pages. Right. It's a quick um, read. Mm-hmm. But well, and that's the thing is like, it, it, Felt like it dragged when I first read it, but now upon revision, or upon upon revisiting it, it cooks. It really, I mean, like stuff just like flies on the page. You nail it so well when you talk about the pacing, because it, there are islands of calm and happiness and tranquility in this book that uh, sort of mimic, in many ways, the the little uh, grassy. Uh, uh, hillocks or whatever he calls them that he passes over in the haunted swamp as he's on the way to the the burial ground where it's like you're surrounded by all this haunted horrible shit but you got these little tiny islands you have to jump between and that's those times on the porch drinking the beer it's the it's their first christmas together it's their halloween but there's it's still when you look back because once the book hits a certain point it doesn't stop thrashing you with terror and you look back at those times and you crave them you're like oh my god can we just go back to having beer on the porch again (laughs) because i just want this to get better and it's it's not gonna happen i mean honestly after after the pascal victor pascal death (sighs) this is when shit just really gets real i mean he Lewis goes home, he makes up with Rachel, things seem like they're okay, they go to bed, 
and then Lewis is away. I do have to just side note on, I have to side note, as always with King, really uncomfortable sex writing. With oh, that, yeah. <laughs> with the makeup. Oh, with the makeup. The bathtub. With, with Lewis and, yeah, yeah. All of that is just like, this is where America's horror dad really should never write about sex. Like, I just want to, everyone's like, everyone in a King novel should be pristine and wrapped in cellophane um, <laughs> at the end of the night. Honestly. Like, like leftovers. There is not a single fucking story that I've talked about yet in this uh, season that hasn't, except for Misery. Misery is the only one that is free of a sex scene. Thank God. <laughs> Could you fucking imagine? I, I'm, I'm glad we went there. It, it was something that was in a lot of people's minds. And I think as, as far as this book is concerned, the rest of any inferences about sex are like closed door. It's like we, okay, they go in, they do it. We know they're doing it. And then they go to sleep. And at some point, we do have to mention, as King refers to it, the whores. <laughs> yes. If they made it seem like that was just, and maybe I'm just ignorant, but maybe men of a certain generation, was that more of a normal thing to hit up a a sex worker um he mentioned like when lewis thought about it as the, when he had visited a whore six years ago now yeah. ellie's five right right and they've been and he and lewis and rachel have been married nine years Ye oh but it's the weird offhanded nature that king says well you know he had visited a whore six years ago and then it's never brought up again you know, what's interesting is that ties into one of the most famous quotes from this book, where it's the soil of a man's heart is stonier. Yes. Uh, and I feel like that is one of those things that this kind of deals with as well, is the kind of the secret lives of men, um, which... Very much. It, it, it uh, is fascinating in, in its own way. And it's one of those things where it's like, sort of like the path that goes beyond the pet cemetery. I'm not sure I want to go completely down it, you know, um, because I imagine there, there are some unpleasantness there. If, if you're offhandedly casually mentioning that you as a married man visited a sex worker, you say it just as casually as you'd say, I went to the grocery store last Wednesday. To me, that just implies a certain level of normal, uh, normality surrounding that act that does not exist today as far as i as a person who's been married for 22 years have not experienced that i know of <laughs> and i don't it's like part of me it's like you know i don't want to know i don't if if uh if if that's something that uh my husband did when we were married you know for a few years i don't want to know i uh, it's all right you know that that stone in your heart can remain <laughs> unturned <laughs> but but jumping ahead a little bit you know judd just Judd does talk about that, that Norma never knew. He never said anything to Norma that he had, he had gone and, and visited a sex worker. Yeah. Um, that she never knew. and that, But that also, Norma never would have left him anyway. Right. Even if she had known. But part of her would have died inside. And that is so telling of such a time period. I mean, it's weird as the, the book, I mean, there are chunks of the book, you know, because again, the casualness of like, Lewis going and seeing a sex worker, which would have been in the 70s, which, dear God, chlamydia. Um, <laughs> yes. But then, I'm just saying, he, Lewis had a lot of access to penicillin. He did. So, he did. <laughs> uh, you know, he casually just goes and sees a sex worker, you know, at some point in the 70s, in Chicago. I, I think I just got syphilis even hearing that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> I, but then... But that's also like that's not it, it's not a great thing, but it's not like the worst secret probably that you can come up with. For sure. But it's still very telling that for that time period, which would have been like, you know, for when it happened to Judd, it would it, you know, he he was still in his twenties, so it was would have been like sixty years prior, which would have been some yeah, we, it was sometime in the twenties. Yeah. And, and you know, and Judd's got a lot of really horrific ways of how he described all of it. Oh, and Judd has but, a, um, a ha, yes, and he and he has a lot of secrets. Men tend to their own garden. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in the book about you know keeping these secrets to ourselves and following a certain path in life. When they're going up to the pet cemetery, um, Judd has a line telling Ellie 
you know, you stay on the path. It's when you veer off the path that things go astray. Right. And, 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 and in that best, like, save the cat kind of way, that would be probably the thesis statement for entire book. It's when they start to veer off the path, that's when things go astray. It's interesting how he toys with sort of the idea that the forces around them are trying to veer them off that path because when he is awakened in the middle of the night by a crashing thud and sees a very dead but very alive Victor Pascal with his crushed skull standing over him and saying, hey, follow me into the woods. I have a warning to deliver to you. What was interesting, and this was explained later on, it was because their uh, souls were near each other when uh, Victor was quote unquote discorporated which is a word that I still don't see very often. And that was the first time I had in, ever encountered it was in this book. Um, and so then Victor feels driven, I guess, to warn and contact Lewis from the beyond. Um, and he takes him out to the pet cemetery in bare feet, Lewis's bare feet in the middle of the night. He's not even dressed. I think he's only wearing like a pair of boxer shorts or something. And uh, he tells him, points to this giant deadfall that stands in the path beyond the pet cemetery and says, do not go beyond the barrier was not made to be broken. And then Lewis wakes up the next morning, convinced it was a horrible nightmare. This is the stuff I love the most is that his, it's a bright and sunny day. His kids are playing. It's a nice cheery morning. Rachel's making pancakes and he throws back the covers of the bed and finds his feet covered in mud and pine needles. Yes. Oh my a god. And then of course again logic inserts itself. You know, maybe I did walk in my sleep. But the whole ghost warning me not to cross the barrier, that was just the dream. I've been real stressed out. Another opportunity to write it off, but this is again another kind of chip taken out of the facade, the nice perfect idyllic facade of this life um out in the country. And of course, we know the barrier is going to be broken. It's just like as certain as Chekhov's gun is going to be fired. You wouldn't mention the barrier if we weren't supposed to cross it. This is just an element of storytelling, right? Um, so, of course, that opportunity presents itself relatively quickly. They have a, a nice little fall together as a family some more beers on the porch. It's getting chilly out. Judd's wife, Norma, has a heart attack on Halloween. Uh, Lewis comes to her aid, gives her some medicine that helps sustain her when they get her to the hospital. Norma ends up surviving it and all that. So that was a, an intense moment. So when Thanksgiving comes, three of the four family members, the kids and Rachel, fly back to Chicago for the holiday. Lewis is at home alone, gets a call from Judd. He's like, your cat... Uh, your cat's dead over here on the grass. Poor old Church the cat, much to Ellie's fears that uh, he would die. You know, that whole conversation comes flooding back. That whole fight with Rachel comes flooding back. Oh my God, the cat has just been killed. And Judd, feeling this sense of gratitude for Lewis's help with Norma, decides... Or does he really decide? Because that's the ultimate question. And that is, again, we talk about the choices that we make that we know are bad, that are based, rooted in a deeper impulse that we can't really control. But he takes Lewis on a little walk, does he not? Which, it's hard to rate the scariest scenes in this book. <laughs> there are so many. But that walk that they take. That walk is so supremely creepy. It's also the point where, like, after they've had, I can't remember, I'm trying to remember the chronology in the book, if this is when, when Lewis is thinking about, like, his earlier dealings with, like, Rachel's father and things like that. Yeah, we get a little bit of that. Yeah, we get some of that background. And he's perfectly content to, like, not go. It was all for naught. And, you know, and now church is dead. And, and of course, I can feel that conflict in Lewis's head, because ultimately, if, if he just owned up to the fact that the cat was killed in the road. But here's the thing. It wasn't like a task that he 
was refusing to face he was just dreading it the way most people do it's like oh god i'm gonna have to like yeah you know take her maybe i'll have to bury the cat and take ellie to visit the cat maybe at the pet cemetery and this is gonna suck and i don't know how i'm gonna do it but it's gonna suck lewis was prepared and like most people to deal with a task that sucks but then judd comes along and tries to be well it's funny like Judd dresses this in an altruistic way, like you helped Norma, and also I didn't want your little girl to suffer and all this. But like much later in the book, he says it it was definitely more than that because it gets hold of you, and you want to share that secret and you want to pass it down, and it also wants you to share the secret. There's something about living adjacent to that sort of power that wants you to share it with someone close to you. I can almost understand that as well. Like if I knew that there was a patch of ground, that if you bury something dead in it, it comes back to life. Even if you know what it does <laughs> to the things it brings back, would you be able to um, keep that to yourself? That's a really big ask right there. I mean, what I always like about King is that King very often uh, takes sort of like the big picture questions any small scale. You know, and, and, and Pet Cemetery is a great version of that, which is what if you had in your backyard power over life and death? How much of that would you really, how much of that would you want to play with? Oh, yeah, yeah. That is, that is that's such a Mistopheles-chin, you know, bargain to be making with yourself. It, it, indeed. And, and maybe part of him is also thinking it's just a cat. You know, it's not like putting a person up there. And that comes in later, obviously. But Judd buried his dog, Spot, up in that burial ground under the quote-unquote assistance of the town drunk um, at the time when he was eight years old, I think it was. And so that's how he knew about it. And so it's almost like a secret that just gets passed down from person to person. And so Judd ended up being that guy for that desperate person. And it takes what seems like good intentions and twists them in a way. But of course, we don't know any of this is happening until the fact that Lewis, he was in the garage messing around when church came back. I love how he described it as when he saw the cat, it was almost like he just knew like, oh, of course, there he is. Like he had a, almost a sense of expectation around it. So it was almost like, oh, there he is, which is odd unto itself, but also I think a way of your brain trying to like protect itself from the madness that it's witnessing. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. So here's church, um, except he's a little different, isn't he? He's not quite the same cat. He's, he was quite dead, in fact. And, and that was the other thing he was trying to work out. He was like, is the cat, was the cat even dead in the first place? Well, he was stuck to the frost in the ground. That's how dead he was. He wasn't melting the frost around him. He was stiff. He was, he was D-E-A-D -E dead. And so when he picks him up and he looks at him, well, the cat stinks to high heaven. He smells of the sour earth in which he was buried. That's like a, a hallmark of the of this story with this burial ground is the sour earth. So um, not only that, Church is kind of clumsy. He, um, you know, cats are naturally very graceful and, you know, ag agile. Well, Church was not. He he could jump off of things, but he would stumble. Um, he was kind of just dull and slow. And, and not only that, we come to find out that uh, Church has developed a bit of a bloodlust. He kills a lot of birds. He kills a lot of mice. And he leaves them almost as like, he leaves them right in Lewis's path every single time. In some ways, he's almost more cat-like. I'm in many ways describing a, a almost like a feral cat in the sense of his social issues and, you know, smelling bad and, and killing a lot of animals. I mean, that's, that's very cat-like, but it's not like he's ultra super demonic, but he's still creepy as hell. The cat is essentially alive, but almost like he's just a four-legged furry skin suit with something animating it. it it's a... Uh, chilling on its own and of course the kid you know ellie notices right away church smells bad and she starts to grow more detached from the cat 
as time goes on because the cat is just weird and he stinks, you know, so that she kind of loses a bit of that super lovey dovey attachment that she had to him before that. It's just that she doesn't understand why, which I find interesting. So after church, uh, things kind of settle out a bit. You know, it seems like they kind of return to a sense of routine and normalcy and they go through winter, they go through Christmas and during the winter, Judd's wife uh, passes away from a stroke. Um, so that resurrects again, for lack of a better word, the discussion of death and dying and Ellie dealing with it and, you know, Rachel coming to terms with it herself. And it seems like they're kind of entering a healthier place, a happier place, like a, they're settled in. And that's really when you should be on the lookout for anything coming out of the clear blue sky, right? There's no way that you're going to reach that level of normalcy and thing and shit's not going to go awry. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And the way that King enters the second part of this novel is one of the most... Uh, eff- <sighs> I will just say this. Um, When I first read this book, I didn't know what was going to happen um, to Gage. And part one of the book ends on a very, very high note. He has a perfect day. Lewis has a perfect day with Gage flying a kite in a sun-drenched field. And it's just, he talks about how perfect this day is because it's the last perfect day he ever has. So we already know that things are going wrong. And then he even ends the chapter prior to this knowing or telling us in very plain words that in six weeks, Gage will be dead. Um, And then we turn the page and here is Lewis at his son's funeral, just a couple months down the road. And very quickly we get into... Uh, not only did he die, he, he was hit by a truck. All right, you guys. Well, as any fan of this show knows, when the discussion gets really good, sometimes things tend to run a little bit long. And James and I made no exception in our discussion of Pet Cemetery. Uh, the raw footage ended up being over three hours long. And even after some good editing, I decided to go ahead and break this one in half just to give it a little bit of room to breathe. Uh, but don't worry, you don't have to wait till next week. We will actually be back tomorrow uh, with the conclusion where we will not only be talking about the darkest and most terrifying parts of Pet Cemetery, but also the film adaptations. So please come back for that. In the meantime, if you do like what you're hearing, please pop on over to Apple Podcasts and give the show a review. Uh, It really helps boost its visibility out there in the greater podcast sphere. Uh, Would also love to hear from you on Twitter or Instagram or Gmail. The handle is ddarknesstime for all three. We will see you guys tomorrow for more talk on Pet Cemetery. Take care now.